Support the Amigos podcast on Patreon or PayPal and receive cool perks and rad swag. Visit our page at everythingamiga.com slash support. Amiga, the first personal computer that gives you a creative edge. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Amigos. I'm John. And I'm Aaron. And today, Aaron, we're going to be talking about legends. Mm. Aaron, are there any living legends left, or have they yeah, all passed? You're looking at one, pal. Are you kidding me? I Give get legendary break. status just by putting up with you. <laughs> mm. And the brand, of course. Yeah, you're a legendary something, all right. <laughs> what the? How dare you, sir? Who, who's left? I mean, I guess, would you call Ric Flair a living legend? Oh, if you're a wrestling fan, he is. You know, there's plenty of legends around, but I mean, how many names are, and wrestling aside, names are legends that aren't sports or entertainment related? Go. There are none. none. There are. We just don't know who they are. Yeah. Brilliant professors, chemists, scientists, inventors, you know, geneticists. These are the true legends, but we'll never know their name. It's one of the yeah. uh, weird things in life. Like, never one knows the name of the guy that played Spanky. And the Little Rascals, for example. But no one knows the name of the guy who invented you know, genetic splicing. I mean, I don't know it. You know what I'm saying? So there you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now, people say don't meet your heroes. Don't meet your favorite legends. Do you find that to be true? I know that you've met a lot of your heroes in life. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, a little bit. Would you follow that advice? <clears throat> you certainly don't want to learn about them. <laughs> for sure. Don't learn anything about them. You know, I, I'm not a big hero worship guy now don't get me wrong uh, when i met the nature for example and when i say met because these things like i met people but i didn't like really meet them you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's like yeah i was in a lot of people that met the nature but he didn't know who i am i'm just some schlub uh but it was it was neat you know but yeah it they never very often they don't pass close inspection mm -hmm. you know now yeah. musicians and stuff i said the it varies some some actors and musicians and uh, entertainers are real nice people that do a lot of great stuff. You know, then some aren't. So, what about who who do, who would you put in the legend category from any walk of life? Oh boy, well you know I always think about uh, people that transcend um, you know the the world that we live in. So I would call you know love him or hate him. I would call Steve Jobs a legend. Oh god, not the not the jobber. Come Just on. because he is. He's the face. He's the face of Silicon Valley. He's the face of all these things that are in our pockets that we're addicted to. Uh, so you know, I, I would call him a, a legend. I would uh, in the uh, in the entertainment world. I don't know because entertainment is so fleeting. You know that a legend is somebody that that stands the test of time for generation after generation. Maybe somebody like uh, Frank Sinatra. You know, definitely Elvis. Elvis is a because you also sort of have you have to have a mystique about you as well. It's not enough to just have like you know uh, lots of achievements in your life. You have to have you know stories have to be told about you. So I think Elvis probably a legend, um, but I don't know because we don't really have a monoculture anymore where everybody is just looking at the same things, talking about the same things. Maybe we're seeing a death of the legend. Maybe legends are just they're they're dying off and they're not coming back, man. I have to disagree with you. I think I know lots of people that have had mono recently, but anyways, do you? I, oh yeah. So uh, I think you've got. I mean, in terms of who are you running with these days? <laughs> hey, yeah, mm. I go to prisons for God's sakes. Uh, okay. I think you've got plenty of entertainment legends. You know, I mean, Elvis, sure, but guys like Houdini come to mind, or uh, Laurel and Hardy, Buster Keaton, those guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think those are legendary mm -hmm. uh, uh, actors and actresses. Do you uh, think that people are still telling stories about Buster Keaton? I mean, I, people know that Buster yeah. Keaton was a comedic silent film actor, but he's not a legend. He he's not like freaking Elvis Presley. He made the oh yeah, he is. He 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 personally influenced a ton of people. I mean, oh yeah, that, I'm not, I'm not saying that he didn't. You know, and then I just all, wouldn't I I wouldn't rank him like if you ask Eep, do you know who Buster Keaton is? She will have no idea. But if you ask Eep, do you know who Elvis is? She will know, and that's she, what makes a legend is international acclaim. Well, but also My, he was more he's more current. Ask him if you ask most kids in your class, 
who those guys were. I bet some of them, would, there might be, most, I will say Elvis is there, but how much do people know him just because of the comedic value that was invested in Elvis? You know, what? You saw, Nobody not, ever made fun of Elvis. Yeah, exactly. I saw Elvis pumping gas out the 7-Eleven, that shtick. I mean, I'm just saying they're, he's more current. I'm not, I don't, I think there's a, a, listen, do your kids know who Laurel and Hardy are? Do they know who no. Abbott and Costello are? No. But they maybe heard the whole, the who's on first gimmick. It's been lampooned a million times. So those are, Probably that not. sort of counts. You know, okay. Listen, well, I mean, today, you, can have a legend, you know, I would, I would definitely call that bit that that's definitely a legendary bit. I yeah, would yeah say. But that that counts. It's connected okay. to them. So, okay. I mean, well, can you? What's a legendary Greek or Roman actor? Do you know any? I'm sure there are some that are still known to some people, but I don't know them. You know. Mm-hmm. So there you go. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's lucky, Aaron, that uh, that there there still are some legends left, and they were, and unfortunately, none of them were featured in today's game. Legends. Ooh, sounds like <laughs> so an early very, knock. Very, uh, very poorly named title, but we'll get into that in just a second. For right now, Aaron, let's dive in to this week's Amiga news. Amiga news. All right, Aaron. Our first story comes to us from Quora. Are you uh, familiar with the site Quora, Aaron? I I, don't, I know of Quora. Okay, so this is a site. It's it's it, it people ask questions and other people answer the questions. It's usually one I of guess the pages it's a, you go to when you're desperate for help. Yeah, you, you yeah. Or if you're just here. extremely bored. Yeah. Um. And and uh, and <laughs> I'm never so that bored. on the uh, on their um on their site, Dave Haney has actually. Uh, answered the question, is the Amiga computer manufactured today? I don't know why Dave Haney chose to step in and answer this question, but he has. Um, and uh, he's now, I don't know, he might have even posed the question just to write an answer. I don't really know how, how Quora works. But at any rate, if you're interested to get Dave's take, and this is sort of, you know, I'm sure that he's told these stories many a time, but if you're interested in the most recent version, of this taken, maybe uh, uh, the spotlight will be thrown on some additional information that he has not ever shared before. Make sure you check out this very detailed response that actually goes into the, all the oh, next yeah. generation Amigas, all the Trevor Dickinson stuff. Uh, this is a very, and of course, you got to end the, uh, the the article with the Mister and the Unamiga. He goes into all of these things, so uh, definitely check out this uh, in the link in the show notes. You can see uh, Dave's response. A very well done, well put together answer from Mister Haney. I'm more fascinated with the thought of posing my own question. And then giving an elaborate answer to it. I think that now I'm starting to get interested in Cora. Why does Amigo Aaron rule? Hey, listen, that's <laughs> that right there. The people have asked, or how do how do I know who this is? He's an untalented hack, and I can explain how I got here. <laughs> untalented hackery on a grand scale. Now, Aaron, our next video comes to us from the one, the only, ten minute Amiga retrocast. Yes. That's right. Doug is back with a new video all about the Amiga 2000. This is going to be a multi-part series called Let's Build an A2000. What can you tell us about this video, Aaron? I did watch this one right out of the gate. I was one of the first people to jump in when I saw this because the Amiga 2000 is one Amiga that I've not I got to fiddle with that much, to be honest with you. So I was interested to see what's going on there, what makes that sucker tick. And Doug goes, goes to work. One thing that's... You know, I, often, occasionally, me and uh, uh, Doug will cross paths from a tech standpoint. But one thing that separates us is that he's very thorough, well-read, knowledgeable. He takes these things completely apart, cleans them. You know, whereas I just get some duct tape. I think I know what I'm doing. I just, I just kind of cobble crap together. Doug is the kind of guy you want to actually do the stuff on your computer. And he goes to work on this Amiga 2000. Of course, he's got a thousand of these things right. in his house, along with the, uh, uh, all the accoutrement. Uh, he's pulling A2000s out of his, out the yin yang here. When he and he, but he he's going to cobble together the king dong of Amiga 2000s. So this first video, he just goes over the different the various uh, parts of the of the Amiga 2000, the motherboard. He goes into great detail on the Zorro slots, the uh, ISA slots, how they work in conjunction, the kind of cards that were made for him. It was actually they're quite ingenious, uh, the way those things were, you know, the way that they were planned out. It's mm-hmm. kind of cool. He, of course, he's got a uh, A2000 board he had to modify to do extra special double awesome stuff, not just your single awesome stuff. Uh, he goes into the various chips. 
Uh, he goes into what they do, their names, the whole nine yards. Then he has a, a it decides which uh, sort of interface car he's going to use, what sort of I.O. he's going to have. And then, presumably, during the next uh, episode or adventure, if you will, he's going to begin the cobbling of, of the A2000s together, maybe do some cleaning, and then the... Presumably the troubleshooting, so it should be mm. should be good. I enjoyed it because I like this sort of thing, and I will say Doug, Doug is the perfect guy to explain stuff because he's he just has a kind of he's he explains things thoroughly in a un, easily to understand demeanor and and dumb guy uh, style. Kind of no, I mean listen, about. I need that dumb guy style, but I mean you have to not be an idiot to know what's happening. But I mean it's good stuff. I, I got to mm. give Doug credit on that. It's a it's a very it's a very rare skill that he has, the ability to explain this stuff, and look like a joyous, almost like he's been exposed to the Joker gas as he does it. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, is, Doug is unbelievably happy. I don't seem to quite that happy. But is yeah, the Amiga stuff. 2000, is it the worst Amiga? No. What? Where the hell did you get it's that? Always been my, it's always been my least favorite You've Amiga. You've never it's had so one. so freaking boring. Have you ever touched one? You look one? at it, you might as well be looking at a freaking PC. It's just the boring beige box personified. All computers are like that, Boat. No, <laughs> All big box no. computers look the same. Look at the, the 3000 looks cool. It looks totally different. It Listen, looks totally different. I look at this stuff. I worked on computers forever. Right? It, it, what's inside, is the guts is what counts, man. This, thing's, this thing was a very cunningly designed... Amiga here, man. It's no, it's not boring at all. And if you get bridge boards and crap going on in there, gen locks, now you're in business. It was, it's very good stuff. So I, I, I recommend this. Maybe if you watch this video, but you'll learn something. Bam. Bam. <laughs> Go ahead, boat. Yeah. So anyway, let's move on to the next story. Uh, next up, at we've got a new video. From a uh, a guy, his name is Chris Edwards, and he's talking about the Pi Mega. Now we've talked about this several times in the past here, and the Pi Mega may be most famous for being infected with thousands of viruses in an earlier version. Well, he's back with a new edition, and this is the Pi Mega 1.5C. Okay, and uh, this thing uh, basically, you know, it's it's just an upgraded version. He's upgraded the image size of the SD card. So you can put a full Amiga Tosec package on there, 128 gigs of fun. Uh -huh. uh, it uh, extends the compatibility to include the Raspberry Pi 3B, 4, and 400. I think this might have originally been a Raspberry Pi 400 project that he's uh, he's made more backwards compatible. This has the iGame front end already installed, uh, and uh, it's updated with the latest WHD load fixes. So over 4,000 games come in this uh, in this package. Um, and uh, it uses something called the iDemo front end to uh, to have uh, WHD load demos. So uh, lots of cool things to check out if you are an Amiga fan that also owns a Raspberry Pi and you're looking for another way to experience uh, the uh, the Amiga on the Pi. The, this seems like one of the easiest ways to get in the game. Aaron, you haven't messed around with any of this Pi Amiga stuff, have you? Of course I have, Boat. Are you kidding me? I'm Amigo Aaron. I mess with everything. I have a Pi, one of these gimmicks loaded up on yonder uh, dealio back here, one of my many gutted computers with a Pi in it. <laughs> uh, they, hey, it works. Now, I have, obviously have not seen this newest uh, rendition of this. By the way, I compliment the guy for not only having a cool robot beside him, but also having, what is it, Voltron on the desk, yeah. also cool. Uh, but this looks snazzy. Hey, listen, we always complain about how difficult the entry can be on Amiga. Anytime they can dumb it down. and so, uh, These, these pre-made packages are the best, the best. No one wants to screw with this stuff. I talk to Rob about this all the time. I'm old. I don't want to install crap and make stuff work. I just want it to go. Make work now. So anyone that can make work now on an inexpensive pie, that's good to go. So this looks like something to be worth checking into. All right, Aaron. Coming up down the docket, Neil from RMC with a brand new Amiga video. Uh, these are coming hot and heavy over at the KE 2.0. He is unwrapping a Amiga CD TV, Aaron, the rarest of all Amigas, the CD TV, and the most expensive of all Amigas for, uh, for, for what it did. But that's not all, Aaron. Uh, he also interviews uh, Gail Weddington, Whale, Whale, Whalington? Gail, so 
I can't really remember the name. But anyway, Cloud or employee. One of, yes, uh, one of the uh, developers of the CDTV as well. So uh, I haven't actually gotten a chance to watch this. I think it just dropped yesterday or today. I saw it. But uh, I, I have scrubbed through it a little bit, and uh, I'm going to be checking this out over the weekend. Of course, Neil always does good stuff when it comes to hardware, and having uh, one of the members of the development team on the call is just icing on the cake. So uh, yeah. pretty cool. Uh, the CDTV is a part of the Amiga's history that I know very little about. So I expect to learn quite a lot from this video. I really enjoyed this one, uh, Boat. Much like Doug's video, this is going to be a multi-parter where Neil tears into this thing. I also like Doug. Neil is a co more than competent at repair, obviously. So he's going to go in there. But uh, when he finally fires this thing up, the, uh, the CD doesn't spin up. So there's going to be some repair work involved in this. Boy, the CDTV, a, 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 a beautiful unit, uh, probably ahead of its time. Uh, probably something that never got the, the jack. It never, it never, uh, it was an underachiever boat. Let's go with that. Yeah. The Amiga 500 inside of a VCR case or a CD case. Uh, it looks good. Uh, it, uh, it should have been better than it was. Uh, it was interesting to hear this lady talk about how they marketed it and how impressed, how blown away the CDI people were when they finally saw all the software that was available for this thing. But at the end of the day, uh, it was expensive, and it was uh, uh, it didn't get the job done. I mean, it just it, it, the interest wasn't there. Uh, you know, I will say something. I didn't notice this in Neil's video, and he may touch on it later. But around about this time, like the set top box, that was all you heard about. I remember when I was, you know, this was around eighty nine, ninety, ninety one that time, and all you heard about was bringing the computer into the living room. That's all anyone talked about on the news mm -hmm. and magazines. Everyone thought this was going to be a big deal, just like web TV and all that oh, yeah. stuff. This was going to be the big game changer, and ultimately, it never really, I mean, it never happened, to be honest with you. I mean, I get you could arguably say now it's happened with modern consoles or with Roku or stuff like that, but I mean, the, no one, there's no one out there marketing a TV exclusive computer that's gained like a widespread like everyone's got one in their house you know what i'm saying right uh, it just i don't know if people just didn't want it didn't need it didn't like the control options well I, you know i i think i think the problems were manifold one is that the computer by its very nature tends to be uh you know a lean forward experience where you're really focusing on very small objects on the tv if you're trying to do file management or something like that you're not going to sit across the room, you know, on your on in your easy chair, especially not back then. And so you just couldn't see a lot of the things that you needed to do. But the, of course, the big problem with the CDTV was that it was just so unbelievably expensive uh, that it just sort of priced itself out of its own market. Yeah, it's funny that these go for as much or more now than they did when they were new. It's but yeah. it everybody went up. And I mean, I can see why they're popular. I mean, they are an attractive unit. And when he pulled it open. That's really the first time I've seen into a CDTV before, uh, you know, and it was neat. I like I said I'd never seen what it looked like in there, and it's a, it's a, they did a good job on it. It's a nice tight unit, <clears throat> and it's got a goodly amount of portage on the back. Uh, I think technologically it was fine. This they Neil also mentions that this thing was basically put together by guys who they're off on their own time, mm, you oh. know. So that, interesting, you know. So but once again, and CDI. Who had uh, Phillips behind him, a big company. Uh, also, they fell by the wayside, you know. W w you know, and 3DO in, in some ways was sort of like this. They're the uh, Panasonic 3DOs, the big, you know, the big nice ones. I think they're saying, you know, the bigger ones. I can't remember which mm -hmm. of the big ones. It was the same sort of deal. This will play this, and it'll do that. But it just that stuff just never caught on here, and it still hasn't caught on. Like I said, the consoles come close now. The modern consoles, they've got all that integrated TV stuff and a plus computer, but they're still not straight yeah, up. Yeah, you still the whole market of let's hook up a PC to our TV with an HDMI cable. I mean that market exists, but it's still a niche market yeah. for and, sure. Um, and the funny thing is, if you wanted a TV hooked up to your computer, now when this came out, it was no easy task. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't too long after this. I was one of the first people I knew that had the computer hooked up to the TV because I knew what I was doing. I didn't have a problem having a big, idiotic-looking metal box sitting beside my TV. It wasn't stylish like this, but it was way more functional. you know. Mm -hmm. I, and I just did it dumb guy style. 
And I think ultimately the people that really wanted to have a computer hooked up to their TV did it that way, and the people that didn't do it that way just didn't want it. You know, right. I mean, all these things were meant for entertainment and and education. They were going to have museums on discs and stuff. Again, it's just none of that stuff really caught on. Of course, now that stuff's all been made irrelevant by the internet. But at the time, I mean, these things were sort of doomed from the Jump Street. I think. So, yeah. Still yeah. an interesting look at a, a piece of kit that I'd love to have personally. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Aaron. Our next news story is our new Amiga hardware pick of the month. So that we head over to the uh, Retro Rewind store. And we're, today we're looking at the Clip Box, um, uh, Aaron. This is a cheap and easy way to get your Amiga online. Okay, so the Clip Box is a parallel port Ethernet adapter that allows you to connect your uh, A500, 600, everything possibly even the 1000, although maybe it just hasn't been tested. This thing even works on the CDTV uh, to, oh, never mind. I, I didn't read far enough down the page. It doesn't work with the Amiga 1000 as it uses a different type of parallel port. Yeah. Or I'm, I'm left I'm left in the cold again. But uh, you can take this thing and you can get set up on the old TCP IP stack. You can tell net into your favorite uh, email server. You can SSH it till the cows come home. Aaron, I don't know what I'm talking about. What do you do with this thing? Basically, you can you can use this to to effectively get have a, an Ethernet port on your okay. computer. Uh, it's got like you said, it's got a TCPIP stack on it. These are pretty these are pretty common uh, fare, you know, these days. You know, one thing you can do is transfer files back and forth uh, easier. You know, uh, like for example, with an F with the, in fact, there it is. Duncan just mentioned FTP. Uh, which is that's dandy. That's the same way I've transferred stuff to my Xbox, for example. It's and it works fine. Uh, get on. There are certain uh, you'll be able to access certain things on the internet. You know, we talked about how somebody could get on certain web pages that, you know, with an old with the old Amiga stuff. You can still do that sort of stuff. Just it's still neat. Uh, yeah. uh, neat little gimmick here. Uh, they are selling these for forty five bucks. That's that's like a pretty fair price for these. Uh, I think these are neat. I've actually. Uh, 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 a while back, I received a very similar product, which I've never gotten a fool with. So it's on my list. So I've never gotten to actually do this myself, but I'm definitely it's some, it's it's on my project list. Uh, but as in line with most with every retro rewind thing we've looked at, the price is is low, and the uh, w these guys are uh, local to us as local as and more local than most places. That's for darn sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, they, yeah. They've got a they've got a good output. I've, I actually, uh, I, you know, talked with some of the guys that runs, but they, they, these guys are point on. They know exactly what they're up to. Yeah, yeah, and uh, like you said, you know, the the price is low, the build quality is high, and we do thank uh, Record Rewind for sponsoring the Amigos. Yeah, thanks, y'all. Give them a look. All right, onward, Aaron. Onward to legends. Absolutely. Now, both. I always ask you this. I'm going to ask you again. Is this one you'd seen before this week? Never, never. Yeah, I had. Believe it or not, you're gonna, you're not gonna believe it, but I actually had stumbled upon this at some point because I, I remembered playing it uh, for a short time, and, and we'll leave it at that. So, uh, Legends. This is an interesting game, um, and it's 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 an unusual game for the Amiga. Uh, this came out in '96, boat, uh, pretty late in the game. Yeah. And came out on six discs, so it's also large. Mm -hmm. Six discs, one of the bigger games. Uh, this was developed by Chrysalis. Uh, we've actually stumbled upon uh, a couple of theirs. They did Arabian Nights. They did Lords of Chaos, uh, if you'll recall that one. Uh, mm -hmm. Prison. Lothar. I love this guy, Lothar Mathos Super Soccer. Still one of my favorite <laughs> names. Don't don't screw with someone named Lothar. No. Uh, they did the Manchester United Europe games, all the Manchester uh, soccer games or football uh, games. And this was actually published by an outfit called Guildhall. I don't know if we've come across anything published by them, but I'll look. They've published some stuff. But okay. uh, that's a cool name. I like the name of yeah. it. Yeah. Um, this uh, supported, mul it was multilingual on the disc. You could uh, pick from uh, French, German, or English. Uh, and I want to get into the team that worked on this boat. It's funny because they've got a little, they've got a little uh, note at the beginning of their of the book. I'm, I'm sure you, knowing you, you looked at the rule book on this. They've got a, they've got a piracy warning up here, which I, I always feel bad when I read this. Although they, I will say I never pirated this one, but they mentioned that 
this at, when this game started, uh, they had a two man team in not in December of ninety two, and eventually they completed this uh, during ninety five. I think they said they had up to like nine people that worked on this game. So the the scope of the game grew as the game uh, went through development. Uh, but uh, the uh, the guys that made this were actually had worked on some stuff that we've played before, but actually quite a few things. The coder on this was a guy named uh, Richard uh, Teether, and he worked on it. Remember the game Saber Team? He worked on yeah. that. Uh, the graphics were done by a guy named Mark Edwards. He worked on Chase HQ, and he worked on uh, F1, uh, and he worked on Laser Squad. Uh, so some stuff we've looked at. I think, did we look at Shadow Warriors? I think he, I think he worked on he worked on that one too. I think we looked at that one. Uh, so all the guys on this team have worked on stuff. There's a guy, the graphics guy, worked on Tubin, uh, Mark Potent, uh, and Philip Hackney. He also worked on Saber Team. So these are these guys didn't just fall off the turnip truck. They worked on some decent stuff. Uh, the music on this was done by two different guys credited, Alan Hackney and Matt Furness. Matt Furness is the big dog of music, and uh, he's done a ton of stuff that we looked at, including Alien 3, uh, Badlands, a Tubin, Soccer Kid. He did tons, Ultima 6. He did tons of music, and we'll get into the music. I've got something to say about that in, in a little bit. Uh, this had a AGA 1200 release and a CD32 release. Uh, the docu documentation, when you look at it, it covers... Both the Amiga uh, releases plus the DOS release. So this did have a DOS release. And I was unable to determine which game or which system this was developed on or for. I looked at the PC DOS version. It looks, uh, it's almost identical. So mm -hmm. one, whichever one they were, I, I'm going to assume he probably developed this on the Amiga and then poured it to DOS, but that's just a guess. Um, believe it or not, Boat, this had a 2019 Steam release. Wow. Yeah, I, I was surprised to see, <laughs> to see that as well. Uh, so, did I, what did it? Were there any updates or anything, or was it just a port of the game? I didn't. I didn't look at it. I just saw the mm. note on there. So, just not the drone on and on, but we got, we've got to talk about this dingy uh, opening, the backstory of this thing, boat. Uh, and I'm gonna. There's a synopsis here. I'm just gonna because you sort of have to read know this to know what's going on. So. Uh, basically, an alien race that basically spawned man for their entertainment. All right, they live. I think they live on the moon. It said, and they 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 watched Earth uh, go through its existence and have all these wars and stuff. And they they enjoyed that. The aliens. It was light entertainment. It said they would sit back and watch this stuff on TV and they enjoyed it. And uh, uh, but eventually, an annoying thing started happening on Earth. Peace was breaking out. And the aliens didn't like that. So. They hopped in their time machine, a couple of them did, and they went all over different time periods and they put weapons there that shouldn't be there so they could get the violence going. Well, uh, a British scientist, and this is specified, and yeah. his buddy, uh, Billy, are going to go out and stop that. These guys already know the secrets of time travel. And they stumble on the aliens' plot. And they're going to go out and try to keep these weapons... Uh, from falling into the hands of the of these time periods that don't need them, and so your job in this is to be, you're basically our Billy, and the professor stays back and try to and try to guide you to the different lands you need to go to to clean up the mess. Uh, you yeah. Got now, do you know what game, what recent game, totally stole this whole uh, this 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 whole uh, paradigm? It's amazing to me that anyone would steal this, but please tell me. So, not necessarily the whole, like, going back and getting the weapons to keep Earth peaceful, right. but the whole idea of, you know, somebody going under, you know, being put back into time into different bodies. I mean, this is totally Assassin's Creed. That's the whole plot of Assassin's Creed. Really? I've, I've, yeah. no, I've never really gotten into that. I've played it a few times, but not really. I didn't read anything or had any idea what was going on. So, yeah. interesting. Well, <laughs> there you go. So, you've got... Several different time periods you're going to visit in this, uh, and you actually get to sort of pick at the beginning where you want to go from two of them. You've got 1400 AD America, which is a sort of a, a Native American land. You've got uh, ancient Egypt. You've got uh, 500 AD England, right? So that that stick, and then you've got 400 BC China, and then finally the far off distant time of 2025 AD. 
Oh uh, my so, gosh, it's too far in the future. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's unbelievable. <laughs> uh, so when you start the game, you, you get like an over map, uh, and it lets you pick uh, where you can go. I believe the choices were, are, uh, uh, I believe the choices are ancient Egypt. Is ancient Egypt and America? I skipped through these levels so much that I don't remember. Well, you is. can't. Well, that, you can't pick where you want to go. That's a lie. Oh no, you can. You can. You, you can, can pick, pick the order. You can pick the order in which you play the levels, but right. you must start with the Native American. Right. Level. Right. That's it. That's why. I, I, that's right. Because uh, you could your choice. The second one with the order would be the uh, the uh, snow one or the uh, the ancient Egypt one. I use yeah. codes, so I, I, I skip back to these uh, at my leisure. So, Boat, give us your thoughts on this game's uh, entry. I mean, the startup of it, the entrance movie, the music that plays. What are you? What were your initial thoughts when you fired this sucker up? Well, I, you know, it was the the uh, the the intro is nothing special. You know, it's it's, know. it's like the intro of a bunch of different Amiga games. They they have, uh, you know, like they, they set up the story. When you start playing the game, uh, initially my my uh, impressions were very positive. Uh, I thought the graphics were, were nice and colorful. Uh, I thought that the characters were animated well. Um, I thought the music was present, so that made me happy. Um, it was present. But uh, the... That was my first impression. My first impressions immediately took a nosedive, though, upon playing the game. Uh, the, the problem is, the, well, let's go over the good things, okay? So the good things are you have uh, some different worlds. You get to play different characters. You get to explore different time periods. Uh, each character that you play has their own weapon that acts differently from all the other ones. Um the, the way that this game is laid out, you might take a look at this and think immediately that this is a Zelda clone, but it's not. It's a totally different type of game than Zelda is. Um, you know, you, you're going to draw comparisons visually with the uh, A Link to the Past, which is the, uh, the the Zelda for the Super Nintendo. Graphically, it's, it's kind of on par with that. It's definitely more on par with that than the 8-bit Zeldas. Um, but where that the, the games differ is that at its core... Zelda is really a puzzle game with action elements. You know, all the all the the old Zelda games work exactly the same. You run around the overworld, you talk to people, you get different items, and then you go into the dungeons. And the dungeons are the bulk of the game. And inside the dungeons, it's not so much about you know killing a bunch of enemies. It's about solving puzzles. You've got to push blocks. You've got to reveal. You've got to bomb places to reveal hidden areas and things like that. This game is a lot more action-y than that. This game basically takes those action elements that you find in the overworld of the Zelda games and it applies them to the dungeons as well. Uh, there are puzzles in this game, but the puzzles aren't really like spatial puzzles. It's more like the puzzles that you might find in a Dizzy game where you're basically like, I need this item. You know, somebody, you'll talk to a person, they'll say, well, I need something to help me do something else. And so you'll roam about the landscape searching for that item. When you bring that item to the person, they're able to complete their task and they'll give you some sort of a reward, usually another item that you'll need for later on down the line in your quest. That is Legends in a Nutshell. Um, yes, very well summed up. I think you nailed it, dude. That's exactly what you do. It's a... I don't want to say the European slant on a on a Zelda game, but that you're right. The puzzle the the puzzle elements are the old. You know, I mean, listen. The first level, I need a rattle. You need to bathe in these certain waters. You need the fire sticks. You need fire, and you and it, none of the stuff's readily available. So you just go hunting around. Then eventually you stumble into it after you get past something, and then you go take that back to where it goes to get to the next element of the puzzle. It's it's that's rinse and repeat sort of thing. So yeah, I, right. I agree with you fully on that. Now, when you when you're roaming about the landscape, there are indoor areas. You can go into different structures like houses, or at the first level, it's like teepees or wigwams or whatever. Yeah. Um, and uh, you can talk to people just as you would in a Zelda game. There's a lot of dialogue in this game. One of the interesting things that I noticed about this game is that when you look at a sign. It will actually zoom in. The camera will shift, and it will zoom in on the sign. Um, it's a little bit disorienting and it's jarring to see it. Um, it's goofy. I thought to myself, how yeah. much time did they spend working on this? And the effect, this this is not 
Star Fox here. I mean, this is <laughs> no, this is it's Star what you sucks. Call a top shelf graphical effects. It's like take a real low res picture and then zoom in as far as you can. It's like a, it's just like a yeah. blocky yeah. disaster. And and so what you know you you got to go through and just like any you know uh, role playing game like this, uh, you are talking to people to decide to figure out what they need so you can bring it to them. Um, now, this game in a in a special way. I, you know, my, my thoughts on Zelda and its status as a role-playing game are well-documented. I don't think that the original Legend of Zelda or The Link to the Past are, strictly speaking, um, role-playing games because they don't employ an element of statistics with your, you know, to me, a role-playing game needs to have equipment that you can upgrade. And when you upgrade that equipment, you need to be able to see statistics to show you how much better your hits are. Um, in this game, you don't have that, but what you do have is you have statistics on your enemies. So whenever you uh, fire a projectile at your enemy, uh, you see a number over their head, and their, that number represents their remaining hit points. So in that way, this game I would actually consider to be more of a role-playing game than A Link to the Past is. Yeah. Uh, it's is that a very the only similar element? To... You're, because th those numbers, are they almost seem random. You can shoot no, a guy they're the two or same three every times. single time. You can shoot a guy two or three times in a row, and those numbers change for, for no discernible reason, though. Incorrect. They, that, that, I did not find that to be the case. I they did. go 10, 5, 0. Trust me, I would sit there and empty arrows in the guys, and it would just be like... Because occasionally you could get a guy to get to be caught on the geography, so you could just sit there and shoot him in the back over and over, and the numbers would just... <laughs> they weren't consistent. I can tell you that right now. It wasn't, to my knowledge, that they were consistent numbers. They were, the, uh, I, I didn't now, know. At first, I thought thing, they were points. I was like, "What is this?" I, mean, was, I guess it's hit points. Yeah, it's it's hit points. So um, now let's talk about some of the things uh, that I I want to talk about. A couple more things that I liked before we go into the parts that I didn't like. Um, I thought that it was really neat. Most of the time, when you complete a quest. You know, like in a role-playing game, a lot of the times when you bring the guy their item, they're like, finally, now I can fix the roof of my house. And that'll be it. He'll stand there for the rest of the game in eternity, still as a statue. He never fixes his house. In this game, whenever you complete a quest, most of the time, you'll actually follow the person. Like, I remember there's there's one uh, scene where a guy, he's trying to fix the clock. In a, in, a, in a chapel or a building or something like this. And I, I think this might have been in the uh, the England section. And so when you bring him the thing, when you bring him the ladder, I think you're giving him a ladder, you'll actually follow him out into the village, into the town square. He climbs up. This is all in engine cutscene. He climbs up, fixes the thing. Something falls out. I think a key falls out of whatever he's trying to fix. You collect that key for your next your next part of the, the voyage. But I really thought that that was cool. I really like the fact that they scripted all of that stuff in because it gives you more of a reward. When you complete a quest, it's not just a text box saying thanks very much. You actually get to see it. It's like a little treat for the eyes to see that. So I thought that was cool. Now, Aaron, it's time to talk about the things that are not so great about Legends. Well, hold on a second. Before, be before you jump in, let me jump in on some stuff I did like. Uh, oh, we're, yeah. Go ahead, We're going to go over the good stuff. Uh, when I first put this game up, and I'll get into, I was not, I had, I had low expectations, Boat, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, but, I will say, this, this reminded me, now again, you know I'm no Zelda guy, or whatever, but this did remind me a lot of, like, games that me and the Brent would occasionally pick up on the old NES. Uh, including the screen, you know, pretend that instead of hitting the space bar to get your inventory screen, if you hit that you know, start button or select on the old NES controls. Very similar situation with the inventory screen. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, they, I like the fact that they have a map screen. That was helpful. You know, not yes. every game is going to have that. I think that's cool. I like the fact that they put a lot of, I mean, there's six discs. And there's a ton of content in this thing. I mean, it goes on forever. I don't think there's a complete playthrough of this on YouTube. I saw some pieces of some. But, I mean, the, the, the just the finishing one scenario takes hours. And, you know, and you've got other worlds to visit. So there's a ton. There's a ton here, and I I thought the puzzle element again. It was a very European style puzzle element, but I mean, it was for the most part. I thought it was sensible. To, for at least all the stuff I saw, I could I could get mm -hmm. an idea. I mean, I had an idea of where to go and what to do next, which I don't always have. The map again plays a big part in that because I can see where I've been. When you can see where you've been and you and where you need to go. It kind of helps you figure out what you need to do. It's funny how that works. 
uh, I thought the uh, there was there was there was a disconnect in this game between the the cutscene pictures and the actual game. But I thought the actual game was fairly pleasant to look at. I thought it the graphic. I thought it was. I thought it looked nice. You know, for the most part, I thought the uh, uh, it was colorful. You know, uh, I thought the enemies were interesting. I'll just, we'll leave it at that. And I thought that if uh, uh, the uh, the background stuff, like you mentioned, I like I like some of the idea uh, that that's of the wacky things. Like for example, when you visit the the uh, the, me- the medicine man, the when and he channels that spirit early on in the game. That eventually he poofs up and he falls in that mystery hole. I thought that was like I said the little. It almost reminded me of something out of Battle Chess, a little funny little animation. So I agree with you on the on the little cut scenes. They make it more pleasant, uh, and make the game more pleasant. And overall, the game has a pleasant atmosphere. Uh, it's it, that that it, it would look like a game that would be fun to play. So I will say I, I thought there were elements of the game that were very uh, attractive. So I think you've got. I think there could have been an excellent. The bones were here for an excellent game. There yeah, you go. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree. I'm glad that you mentioned the map because you're right. Not a lot of games on the Amiga of this or of any vintage really uh, offer you that overhead map at the touch. But you could tell that they learned some lessons from uh, the, the Super Nintendo Legend of Zelda, which we should we should point out launched a full five years before this game. Yeah. So that, that, there was lots of time to learn. Did you um, did you get that sort of this that reminded me more of an NES game than a Super Nintendo game, just from the uh, the way it was, the way it yeah, ran, it's, it's, and structured, it's, it's, the it map looks screen. Like, it looks like the, a Super uh, Nintendo inventory. game. Yeah, yeah, it looks like a Super Nintendo game, but the uh, the uh, a lot of the gameplay mechanics are more like an eight bit, like simple for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Now, please um, rip it to shreds. Now, feel free. Well, no, I'm not going to rip it to shreds. <laughs> this is a, this is this is another classic example of where the developers have, have taken the game 80% of the way to where it needs to go. And there are just a couple things that they could have done to make it a, a real, a, you know, a real contender in terms of, you know, if you want to play a Zelda like game, here's a, here's, here's something that will, will, will satisfy that itch. Okay. Problem number one, you are surrounded by enemies, no matter where you go from the get go. Okay. And the and I'm going to constantly compare this to the Legend of Zelda because it's obviously this is a an, an homage by, to Link to yeah. the Past. Okay. Yeah. So um, you know, in in the Legend of Zelda, there are often very clear lines of demarcation where you you're in the village and you're safe. You know, you're you're you can go around, you're talking to people, uh, you can explore different areas, and you don't have to worry about enemies attacking you. OK, there's none of that in this game. In this game, you've got to be on your toes at all times. It's just like freaking Inspector Clouseau in the Pink Panther. His bodyguard is always going to be around the Kato. corner sneaking up on him, <laughs> trying to get him. So that's no good. That's no good. That takes you out of the realism. You know, a lot of times when you go to visit a village and you're you're talking to this family with a crying baby, you're not going to have a guy run up behind you with tomahawks swinging his arms akimbo. OK, that's no good. OK. Problem number two, once you dispatch these enemies, they don't go away. They just keep on coming. They will respawn at the drop of a hat. A lot of times the enemies are just set up to just keep coming no matter what. So you never get a breather in this game. You know, a big part of this game is determining your strategy, trying to figure out where you want to go next, and just exploring the world. And having the enemies constantly respawn on you is just, it, it's a total downer because you're just trying to, you know, enjoy the experience, and you're you've got to deal with all these enemies all the time. In a game like Robotron, you want to have hot and heavy action all the time, but in an adventure game like this, you've got to take, you know, y- it needs to be a balance. It needs to be a balance of combat and not combat, and that's not what this game is. Okay, the next problem is the fact that you never know how much life you have. We talked about uh, we talked about how it was kind of cool that the enemies have hit points above their heads as you shoot them; those tick down. In this game, you start the game with three hearts, okay? And the hearts are kind of like it's like a painting of three hearts. And instead of doing the intelligent thing, and when you get hit, it takes off a heart or maybe even half a heart, it takes off a little sliver of the entire heart painting with a white background, okay? 
this game is pretty generous with the amount of hits that you can take before you die. It's even more generous than Zelda in that regard. However, I would argue that the game is more difficult because you're presented with a lot more enemies to deal with right from the get-go. Yeah. But they should have just given you a heart system that just took away hearts when you got hit. It's impossible to know how many hits you have left until you're dead in this game. And that's a real down. That's a real down. There are no such things as fairies in this game, at least not in the, any of the parts of the levels that I saw. So in order to get hearts back, you have to kill enemies. That's the only way that you can you can uh, you can get hearts back. So I you're going to be spending a lot of time. I across one place where hearts just jumped out, but that, okay. I, it's I mean literally I saw it one time. So I, I'm okay, with you. So, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that they they don't exist, but it's it's definitely not as plentiful. Like in Zelda, if you go whack in the weeds, you're going to go. You're going to there, there's going to be fairies that pop up, and you can replenish your health pretty easily. But in this game, you spend most of your time. A, getting killed by enemies, and B, trying to kill those enemies so you can regain your health. So in essence, it's a, a lot of combat is just a wash. You know, you're going to get sucker punched a couple times, then you've got to get away so you can fire that same enemy to get that same amount of health that you lost back, and then you end up in the same place that you started with. That is no good, okay? But the really the bigger problem that I have is the fact that there is no way to upgrade the amount of health that you have in this game. One of the great things about Zelda is character progression, okay? You start out and you only have three heart containers. So you gotta be super careful as you're going around the world because those three heart containers go away really, really quick, okay? But as you explore the world, you find more places where you can get heart containers and you can get more health. So you can roam around and you feel a little bit more like a bad mamma jamma as you roll into these places because you've got six hearts instead of three. So you can take more hits. OK, it encourages you to explore the world and play a little bit more loosely and have a little bit more fun when you have more hearts. In this game, you play the whole game with the same amount of life, the beginning to the end. So that doesn't really enforce the whole like adventure game character progression that you want in an adventure game. Likewise, there are coins scattered on the ground all over this world. This is another thing where it's, you know, a, a lot of times the, the games, the game designs were just regressive. You know, in 1996, in an adventure game to find coins just scattered on the ground. I mean, that's that's 1983. That's Super Mario Brothers. You know, they should have put coins, either hide them somehow in flowers or put them in pots or do something with them other than just leave them on the ground. Now, that's not the biggest complaint with the coins. The biggest complaint with the coins is there's not much you actually do with the coins. If you're going to have coins, you need to have a shop where you can buy either upgraded weapons, upgraded armor, more hearts, continues something like that the only time that you use money at least that i saw and again i'm not saying that i ran through this whole game but i did yeah. play it a lot the only time that you actually use the money in game is when you're completing certain quests a lot of times you'll need to buy items from characters to 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 you know move on to the next part of the story that is an unforgivable sin in my eyes in a game like this being able to upgrade your weapons, being able to buy more heart containers, being able to buy various things. Again, it gives you a reason to collect these coins and it gives you a reason to keep playing in an area where you might necessarily not, not ordinarily. So that's the biggest part. But the crowning sin of them all, Aaron, the one unforgivable thing about this game is that the levels are too long and there is no inter-level save system. When you beat a level, you get a password. But when you it, these levels are super, super long and they're super, super hard. Hours And long. not having a way to save the game within a level, I mean, for 1996, unforgivable. Unfor I have no idea what they were thinking. I have no idea what they were thinking. The last thing I'm going to say, Aaron the load times now when we're watching this playthrough right now the load times aren't that bad uh yeah. i don't know why that is i counted and i was using whd load i was emulating an amiga 1200 with whd load seven seconds seven seconds when you enter a, 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 a structure when you enter a cave when you exit a cave that's unforgivable and they make you look at probably some of the ugliest drawings i've ever seen in my life it's hard to pinpoint exactly why these things are so off-putting, 
But all I can say is that it reminds me of a lot of art that I've seen coming out of Amiga European Studios. They're these sort of like grotesque looking characters with very large eyes, but Weird not large shading. eyes in the anime way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I played this. Uh, I I knew you had you had sort of stooged off that I needed to play this with something with save states. And boy, you were right. So yeah. I, I went directly to uh, Amiga Forever uh, to play this. And I played I didn't have the WHD load version. I played the disc version. And even with this thing set up with a bunch of discs, it's still, you know, I got to experience some of the sweet load action. And I knew, where I, I was like, my God, this would be a nightmare. And every time you go in and out of a hut, uh, listen, I loved every point you made. I agree with everything you said. But I, I've got some more fundamental faux pas that this game makes. Okay. And, that you, and you touched on them a little bit. I want to talk about the art. Uh, package. If you look at the if you look at the cover of this box, it's pretty cool looking, right? It looks like yeah. a pretty cool, serious game. When you watch this game load up, I, and I, I, with all due respect to the people that, because I mean, it's a stylized art. Okay, I hated it. I hated the picture of the aliens. I hate all the loading screen art. I hate every bit of the art. Okay, so the art stinks. I don't mean the actual game art. I mean the still photos. I don't like any of it now. Part of that could be because of the, it's dated. Part of it could be because of a cultural difference, but I didn't like any of it, okay? So there's that. Secondly, I'm gonna, I couldn't believe you didn't mention this, so I'm going to mention it for you. This game, I mean, again, it looks like a serious game when you look at the box. Then you read it, you realize it's pretty wacky. But mm -hmm. the and, and I'm not going to say the music in this is bad, okay? But I will say it totally doesn't fit this game. Like the, it makes not one lick of sense. The opening makes no sense. It's it's straight up Euro dance cr trash, as you would call it. The the music for the different levels. I mean, I will say some are better than others, but I didn't like any of them that much. Uh, and, and I didn't think it made any sense. It was repetitive. It did, never stops. And uh, I, the music was just a, was a, a, a dud. I, I, yeah, I got to be honest with you. Uh, you're you're probably right. Once I listened to the 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 track, uh, you know, a couple times, I did turn it off and I played the vast vast majority of this game yeah. without without the but music. I mean, on. even the opening, it sets a bad. Everything about this game when it boots up looks cheap and sets a bad tone. Again, mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not gonna rag on the music because I thought the music was pretty competent. I just didn't think it fit the game. All right, yeah. and the same with the art. I mean, the art's probably cutesy stuff, but I, what are we doing here? Don't put a well, game I mean, out with the legends on the front looking all badass, and then you load it up with some uh, lame o alien crap. Like, the plot is stupid. Like all the, I hated all that stuff. I mean, I th listen, I write so really, on the Legend what you're of Zelda. Is they, if, if they would have, if they would have changed the box art, then you would have been happy. Well, no, I would have been. I still wouldn't have been happy, but I wouldn't have expected some cool game. Like I was going to say, Legend. I'm not the biggest Legend of Zelda fan, but it's not dopey. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't come up, and, and it, the music in it's epic sounding. You know, it right. sounds like something heroic. Right. This is dopey music to go with some dopey art. So those mm -hmm. are two big, those, uh, those are instant turnoffs to me. Then you start running around in the game. It's very mazy. You know, it's got that kind of, you can't go here, you can't go there, you can't jump, you can't do jack, which I understand that's, the, that's the, one of these games. Okay, I can live with that. But when you... When I'm just walking around and I've got bees on me and I've got birds on me and I got these dipsticks with spears or I got on these other levels you've got all these snakes all this other crap like you said it never you can kill it but the second you walk off screen that stuff's coming back it it hounds you and I can't tell you the number of times that that kept me from enjoying the what game was here for that pity pat crap. And there's nothing worse than if you didn't have a save state, I would have killed myself. Mm -hmm. If you go and get all this stuff, and you, I mean, and getting around this game, there's lots of walking back and forth over the same ground. It's one of those games, right? Back and forth. When you do that a hundred times and you're well in, I was saving this thing a lot. There were a couple of times I didn't save it enough, I'd forget. And it's the worst feeling when you're just trying to get back to something because you've got to complete the quest and a B. Or some kind of some idiot charges at you, or something breathes on you enough times, and it knocks you off and kills you. It is a sick feeling, and I can't imagine playing this. And then you, uh, think about playing this back in the day, 
uh, where you've got now, okay, not only is your quest shot and you have to start over, but you've got to sit there and wait this whole thing load up again, you know? Right. Disastrous. It's a disaster. They absolutely didn't need to put all this pity pack crap in here, or they should have put some safe routes in. Having stuff, I mean, there'd be sessions where there'd be areas where you're just like you've got crap all over you, and you're and, it, and it's not like it's a really hard section. It just happens to be where they lo, they logged up a lot of crap to come at you. Inexcusable, In, mm -hmm. not fun. All right, not fun. Again, I rag on Zelda, but and but comparing this to Zelda, Zelda, the, listen, it's not my kind of game. But the people that were making it, they knew what fun was. They knew what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's am, the am, am I wrong? Am I wrong? The people when that I made said, Zelda knew what fun was. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's my point. This this game had the bones to be a fun game. This is mm -hmm. an unusual game for the for the Amiga man. Yeah. And I like the fact, <coughs> excuse me, that you're on a long adventure. This game has all sorts of boss fights, tons of them, right? And the bosses are cool looking. They're decent little fights. They've got all sorts of content in here, and as stupid as the backstory is, I mean, the game is okay, you know, if you sort of disregard that or if you think it's funny. Now, granted, they put some other stuff in here I don't like. You know, there's a lot of attempts at humor that, yeah, that are I, various, I, I, all good or bad. All the stuff really fell flat for me. There's one place where you go, you have to buy, you know, again, you go in the store. This is a perfect example of why this game is not good, Okay. In, in the first level, you go into a big wigwam, okay, that you couldn't, you didn't have access right away. And they're like, finally, you can go to the store. You go into the store, you see tons of little guys that look like they'd be perfect extra men. Why they didn't make extra men in this game or something is beyond me. Yeah. Oh, shoot. Now you're okay. And so, um, and so anyway, you get there and uh, you can't buy anything. The guy gives you the runaround. He's like, you want to buy some of these socks? And you try and buy each one of the pairs of socks. And he's like, ah, -ha, you can't buy any of them. What if, who is, remember, I think so many people forget that people play games for fun. They play to have fun. They don't play to get the runaround. And so that, just so many missed opportunities. That I, I looked at all the levels, okay? And I, I will say I played the, uh, the the Native American one the most, but I I want to make sure to do my due diligence. And really, I mean, it's not like there's a radical, there's a you know there's a, there's a graphical change, but I mean, uh, uh, and I do. It's interesting that you that you play as different characters because you're doing like a soul swap with them. That's the gimmick. So Billy is soul swapping with a person. Keep going. Billy is soul swapping with a person from each time period. Which I can understand. Now, hey, listen, I used to watch Trancers. I get it, right? But uh, ultimately, the, 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 the everything to me felt about the same. There's still incessant enemies that won't go away. Now the weapons change. In some levels, you have a dagger. There's one like the uh, the Egyptian level. We get like a Mister Do Ball, you know. So that that stuff's different. But I mean, uh, the feel of the game doesn't change that much. But I mean, again, if you're the kind of person that likes to go around and explore and unlock these little secret uh, areas and find stuff. I mean, this would be a good game for you. And this game is actually more playable today than it ever would have been in the, in the 90s. Because with the uh, the invention of save states uh, and the invention of modern controls and stuff, this is a lot more, it's a lot better game that would have been there. And the fact that you don't yeah. have to wait for the loads. So, I mean, if you were ever going to play a game like this on your Amiga, now's the time. But you don't want to play it on, on your Amiga, that's for sure. And another thing I would have mentioned, you talk about the save states. This has, okay, it's on six disc. This has a hard drive install, okay? This came late mm -hmm. enough to where it had one. But not being able to have some place to, like, pick back up is is ridiculous. Who's going to sit down and play three hours of this straight? You know? I mean, it, it, you shouldn't even, uh, you sh it, there's no limitation. I can only assume that they'd planned on maybe releasing this on a console or something. You know well, saying? it did because, get a CD32 release. Right, but even the CD32 has had, you could save, they had some savable memory in it, you mm -hmm. know. But, I mean, uh, that's not good enough. To cripple it yeah, on the and Amiga and the, P and the DOS, I'll be fair, I, I didn't try on the knows, DOS maybe, to try to save anything. Maybe that, de maybe that decision was made in 1992. Maybe that was, like, the first thing was, like, hey, we're not going to have save states because it's 1992 and no games have that. But by the time that 96 rolled around, Maybe it was a different deal. I don't yeah, know. This, I mean, I don't know. All in all, 
when it, when this game booted up, I was going to drop the hammer. So I will give this credit. It, it walked me back from the ledge with, with to the to a certain extent with the gameplay. Believe it or not, you know me. I'm sure you expected me to come in here guns blazing because this is not my type of game. But I'm trying to be a fair man. Because despite the fact that it's not my type of game, I can understand the appeal of these games and the fact that it's an adventure game. And, and I thought the puzzles and stuff were pretty interesting. And really the story in the actual levels, you know, what you're doing, I find pretty interesting, all said. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, listen, you've got a choice here on a game like this. You can make this like Time Bandit, okay, where there's stuff you shoot nonstop to collect treasures like an arcade game. Or you can make this like Zelda where they give you a little breathing room or, but you can't have both. You don't get both. Because when you have both, you've got crap. Right. So, so there you go. There's, that's my two cents worth, Boat. Any final thoughts? No. I, I think between the two of us, I think we covered, you know, all the things that this game does right and definitely all the things that the game could have improved on, for sure. Did you uh, did you get any hot, hot, incredibly hot Discord action on this? Or would you like me to have a look at the Discord if it's too hard for you? I, I, I think I can do this. All right, go ahead. Uh, so let's see here. Um... For, uh, we did get some reviews. Uh, we'll start with the one and only Chris Bowles. He says, uh, this is a classic example of developers examining the console's game, the console game, seeing the ingredients to make a great game, but having zero clue on how to put them together to make a decent game. I will gloss over the repetitive tunes and the horrible loading times with bizarre full screen pictures and get to the real problems. <laughs> A million collectibles, the worst firing system ever, standstill, oh, yeah. slow animation and fire, the continual respawning even if you wander off screen for a split second, punishing difficulty level and dull repetitive maps are the real issues. This game, if released three years earlier, would fall squarely and good if all you had was an Amiga category, yeah. but the game came out in the PlayStation era, so that doesn't count. 3.5 out of 10. Well, hold yeah. on a second before you keep going. Folds brings up a couple interesting points there. Think about that for a minute. It came out in the PlayStation era. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, one thing yeah, I, I believe to mention, that uh, somebody in the chat said that uh, Tomb Raider came out at this, the same year as this game. Uh, and uh, if your PlayStation friends came over and they saw you play in this, they would probably have a hearty ho. Now, one thing he mentioned that I forgot to touch on. Uh, and again, this this is mostly for the uh, to, for the level with uh, the first level with the uh, Native Americans. You have a bow and arrow. There's nothing more infuriating when you're fighting someone and their shots repeatedly cancel yours out. Yeah, that is infuriating, and it just makes the battles go on forever. They're so yeah. long. The bow and arrow is hard to line up. I mean, you eventually mm -hmm. sort of get used to it, and you sort of get used to fighting your opponents with it, but it sucks. Suck yeah. weapon. Yeah, I'm sorry. I also sorry. didn't like the fact that your enemies can always fire down at you. Like if they, if you're on a, yeah. if they're on a ledge or and, a higher elevation, yeah. that's no good. And you can't fire up at them. Yeah. Right. They can fire right. across stuff too that you can't. It's a, that. Yeah. I folds. That's something we forgot to mention. But good, good job, folds. What else you got? Uh, Jason Warren says inferior. Five point five out of ten. There you go. Super Famicom writes. Having never played this before, I was quite excited by the screenshots as I've always longed for an Amiga version of Zelda. Boy, was I way off. The puzzles are decent, and there's nice touches like the hit points on the enemies, a la Secret of Mana. However, the game is frustratingly hard due to the poor collision detection, terrible firing mechanics, and the ever-spawning enemies. Yep. This is the basics in an action RPG, and it gets them totally wrong. Even in the empty halls of the Amiga JRPG genre, Legend still isn't worth your time. Three out of ten. He's right. Hit detection, no good. I forgot about that. It's 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 jonky. It's a little wanky at times. It's not perfect. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Did you? Was this reviewed in any of the magazines oh, yeah. of the day, or was Absolutely, this too late? Absolutely, and I've I've got some right here. So, the folks on Lemon, I think, are generously give this a seven point eight six. Uh, Amiga Format gave this 86%. Amiga Power, 80 Now, granted, these are all coming out in at 96 So, uh, which, it's an interesting thought there. Uh, CU Amiga gave it an 81 Amiga Joker uh, gave this an 86 Uh, and they gave the, it's funny, they gave the, they looked at the Amiga CD32 version and the Amiga 1200 version. They gave the Amiga CD32 an 86 and, and the Amiga version an 85. So These are very high scores, Aaron. Uh, the Amiga, well, again, 1996, yeah. Boat. 
Uh, yeah, Amiga, they're like, please keep buying our magazine. We'll rate yeah. all your games high. Amiga Games gave it an 83. So the average magazine rating, according to the fine folks at Lemon, 82% Boatster. Um, mm. Now, I think uh, we both know this has to be taken with the old grain of salt because I don't know how many games were, I don't know how many first run Amiga exclusive games. Well, this came out on DOS too. By the way, this came out on DOS. I want to make, I want to drive that home too. Uh, but, uh, 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 the, I don't have any first run of me games were rolling out the doors in '96, so but they were probably looking at these more just. And there's there's something to like here, you know. If you looked in, if we were in '96 and we looked at this game, we might look at it from a slightly more positive slant. But I doubt it, to be frank with you. I don't no. know. I, I it, it, again, it, it comes from your perspective. If you've ever played, you know, uh, The Legend of Zelda: A Link to the Past, you would think that this was horrible. But if you'd never played a top-down action RPG type game before, you might think it was possible. You might think it's yeah. frustrating because you couldn't save. But the things like the the constantly respawning enemies and everything like that—I mean, the, all that stuff is an Amiga staple. So it's it's not as if you know that was anything new. Well, that's that's um, stuff that happened. On, this game is the perfect example of something. If you took like a a certain type of NES game and combined it with a certain type of Super Nintendo game, you probably would have you could probably come up with something like this. Right, uh, difficult. Sure. Decent graphics? Sure. Uh, large and expansive? Sure. Inventory system that's just so simple but okay. You know, it, it's very it's very old console. Like, But this is 96. Way too late in the game to be putting this sort of thing out. And it wasn't played, great when it came out the first time. We played another Zelda game, and I can't remember what it was called on the Amiga, but we covered another game that was sort of people compared uh, to yeah, Zelda. Yeah, I remember that. I can't remember what that game was called. But I do think that this game is a better representation of the Zelda genre. If you'll recall in that game, you had to spend the first hour or so just looking for your sword. And they, they put it in the side of the castle in a hidden door or something. That yeah. was crap. Yeah. So th this was a lot better. This than is that. almost a game. Like I said, it's 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 a it's I'm not gonna say near miss, but it's you can see the you can see the target off in the distance. You may not be able to hit it. Spear's right. legacy. There it is. Yeah. Pixels for the win. That's the one we're talking about. Um, I looked so, this up. Aaron, oh, I looked this up on eBay real quick, Bo. Oh yeah, yeah. Because this is vital. Okay, I didn't want to miss this. Right now, if you were if you are so inclined, you can buy a brand new box version of this for ninety seven dollars. Your best offer. That sounds ludicrous until you look at what this is sold for. Uh, someone sold a box copy of this uh, recently for fifty six dollars, and another and the CD thirty two version sold for fifty dollars and fifty five dollars. So this is actually going for some decent cash, probably because it was '96. They probably sold just a handful of these. Uh, but uh, I will say this in closing for me: I think the guys that made this put a lot into it. Uh, you wouldn't make a game this large and work on one this long if you didn't, if you weren't down. I'm sure they were fans of this genre, and uh, and but I think you nailed it. Starting the game in '92 and finishing in '96. They probably made a game that, that thought was a good idea in 92, except they made it, you know, even then it was five years too late. So now it's 10 years too late. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. All right, Aaron. Well, let's leave this and head on over to the community section of the podcast. And let's talk about what's been going on over on the old Amigos Retro Gaming YouTube channel. All right, Boaster. So uh, we've, had a, uh, we've had a few things pop up this week. Let's get into them here. Um Let's talk about uh, what myself and the Brent covered uh, just just this past Sunday. It was war, sort of. It was Game Boy Color versus Neo Geo Pocket Color. This was a very civil war because I think we both knew the outcome well before. This wasn't even like the Atari Amiga one where I, I, we had a chance. Uh, we all know that the Game Boy Color like, drop-kicked and crushed the Neo Geo Pocket Color. But it was interesting to learn about. I, I've only touched the Neo Geo Pocket Color once. I've never actually got to play one. And uh, I had played a uh, Game Boy Color. And it's funny, when I look back, I always thought that the Game Boy Color is something that wasn't that big a deal. Uh, uh, it wasn't a big deal to me, but it was a big deal for millions of other suckers who went out and bought one <laughs> because they mm -hmm. sold a ton of these things. The Neo Geo Pocket Color, uh, a very nice machine, superior in, in it, you know almost in every way. Not musically, but every other way. Uh, but uh, it lost, and why did it lose? Well, we delve into why. Why did it lose? What uh, what brought it uh, into being? 
And uh, I thought it was a pretty interesting uh, episode. Uh, but what did you have a chance to listen to this one? No, because you know, uh, because of uh, Snowmageddon here, yeah. uh, I, I have not had a chance to listen to this this past week's episode because that's normally reserved for my morning commute. So, uh, if there's anything good about going back to school next week once uh, the storm is over, will be me getting a chance to check this out because uh, I don't know anything about the Neo Geo Pocket Color, and I'm eager to learn. It was fun. It was a fun episode to do. I want to mention this while on here since we we have a lot of people listening. Uh, we're running a contest over an ARG, and the winner of the contest will receive a Dragon's Lair, a box Dragon's Lair mini cabinet uh, that, that, were, that are all the rage, but they're really awesome. Uh, yeah, they're, and, it's very cool. And this week, uh, Brent, we're going to spin a wheel with 12 people's names on it to pick the winner. There's going to be three prizes, uh, one Dragon's Lair and a couple like uh, second and third place prizes. If you're interested in trying to get in on this, uh, every week we do something different, and this week... We are doing a bit where we are accepting reviews for the two games that we're going to be doing uh, on our next episode, uh, Boat. Uh, I Brent is doing uh, uh, DuckTales, and I'm, the, I'm doing uh, Calibris. Is that what it's called? I, I never can't remember the name. It's the, it's the weird CD, th- or the uh, Sega 32X uh, Hummingbird game. So if you, if you want to leave reviews on this, we'll accept reviews on our Discord under the video for for last week's ARG Presents, so you can email us at uh, argpresents at mail dot com. Just a quick review of the two games, what you thought about them, and if you if uh, you send us a review, you're entered if, with a chance to uh, get picked to win the Dragon's Lair Mini. So it's something I wanted to po- point out this week, just so everyone gets a chance. Boaster, boat, you're not yeah. eligible. I'm afraid. Sorry about that. Oh. Um, let's move on. Boat here, he's back. It's Rob Flack O'Hare, the Flackster. He they got 50 feet of snow. They got no water out in Oklahoma, but the, the Flack can't be stopped. No. And and this time out, he's getting he's getting some crazy rally games on uh, here on Mame. Uh, did you have you got a chance to look at this one, Boat? I haven't seen this one yet. I watched I watched this one live. He's a lot better at these games than I am. You know these games where they give you the uh, route and you're supposed to, you know, drift your car in the right direction. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I, Neo Drift and uh, uh, Great Rally. I, I'm horrible at these games. He's much better. And then we get to the uh, uh, part of the show where Flack shows off some of his pictures from the lawnmower races he attended. Those are, <laughs> those are always good for a laugh. Uh, I, I, that was good. And then also he does some wacky antics with the Mister. Uh, he actually shows how to upgrade the Mister on this on this one. And then I don't know how Flappy Bird. All this I like this built into the Mister. He played some of the built in games. So if you want to watch the Flaxster get down and funky with some entertaining stuff, uh, check this out. All of his videos are top shelf uh, and a good time. And I believe a, a you don't know Flack uh, just came out today or will come out tomorrow. So check check out that. It's a great show. Me and Boat both love. Mm-hmm. Um, here's one, Boat. I just checked this one out earlier today. He's back. Hermski uh, he, with his another one of his unique videos. This time around, it's a complete plays to completion, a game I've never heard of called urban upstart adventure on the zx spectrum uh this looks like an interesting little game it's a classic uh it's a classic text with graphics adventure game where you type in uh go north go south all that jive and in the top screen they draw in uh, a picture and this is as old school as it gets boat uh this reminds me of the coco days uh, where they f- the the picture sl- slowly draws up there and then the colors fill in. Did you play much of these back when you were a kid? No, you know, I played a ton of text adventure games on the Atari. Yeah, um, really. But I, I never, I never had any. Um, I never had any games that had the picture above it. And the first time that I saw screenshots of these games in uh, in in uh, Classic Gamer magazine, which was sort of the magazine that got me back into retro, I was like, "Holy cow! Why did I never see these?" And it turns out that there were a ton of them for the Atari. I just never, you know, they were never on the massive collection of pirated discs that I had. The, these things, they had a bunch of these. Believe it or not, even old me, old A, used to play these on the Coco. And yeah. there were a ton of these things: Sands of Egypt, the Trek Boer, and Black Sanctum. Bunch of great games uh, that that I really loved. 
They were Dallas little, Quest. Dallas Quest. God, I can't imagine I didn't say that. The Brent would kill me. They were <laughs> they were a little more graphically advanced than this one. Certainly a lot longer. Uh, but I have played games with this. Uh, you know, basic games. I I love these. They they really take you back. And mm -hmm. Hermski, I don't know. I, I'll watch this video. Hermski runs runs right through it, and then at the, uh, underneath the video, he actually he actually posts the solution. So oh, it's fantastic! You, if you wanted to take Urban Upstart to school and finish this sucker, Hermski's your hookup. Uh, yeah. So check him out. Always coming back with the great ZX stuff. Another awesome video from Hermski Boat. I, I recommend that one big time. Uh, and finally on the docket, uh, Boatster, uh, it's our good buddy. It's Frodo NL back again, uh, taking care of business on the ColecoVision as only he can. And this time around, he does some of my personal favorites. If we can get that to pop up. There it goes. He does some Popeye on here. He does some Donkey Kong Jr. He does a lot of stuff. And this is a this is a three and a half hour stream, Boat Stream. Oh my gosh! He really went to work. Uh, and I will say, uh, Frodo don't mess around when he gets online to stream. He goes to work. I just watched him, and I don't know if this is what he's going to post or not. But I just watched him. He did a video. I think it was last week where he played. Uh, all almost every conceivable version of Manic Miner, and he is a stud at Manic Miner, and he was great on a bunch of different versions. And it's it was real interesting to see the different types of Manic Miner, how, the different slants, how they compensated with different graphics and colors and resolutions. He played like almost all day, nothing but Manic Miner. He beat mm. him multiple times, Boat. It was, wow. quite, it was quite a show, so hopefully he'll post that one at some point in the near future. But what you're getting right here, and this is some of that more obscure, uh, wacky ColecoVision stuff that you just don't see every day. And by the way, this is him playing Gauntlet. Have you ever played Gauntlet on the uh, on the uh, ColecoVision? Never, but it's moving quick. I yeah, like the speed. It on looks that pretty thing. good, except the, with the exception of the colors. It looks it's a pretty good looking deal right there, Boatster. That's all we got video wise this week. We had a good week though. I had a lot of fun watching all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's uh, head on over to the Discord, Aaron, and talk about the, the uh, high score challenges that we have going on right now. All right. Uh, right now on the Amiga, we are playing Vaccine. This is a crazy 3D Vaccine. shooter. Vaccine! Sorry. Yeah, you don't have to put on the red light. Oh, it's our um, one. And so uh, the, uh, the winner for right now is, uh, and th this closes, there's still tons of time left. It doesn't close until the 5th of March. Z9K9. Uh, but you can jump in and join the others that have, are participating, including myself, in this high score challenge. Vaccine is a strange, strange game, but it's kind of it's kind of neat. It's kind of different. Uh, and on the humble ZX Spectrum, Aaron, we are playing Tornado Low Level. Remember that game? Oh yeah, we weren't good at that. No, no. <laughs> Uh, we are good uh, at many Jigglebox, of those. <laughs> Jigglebox has uh, has taken the top slot right now in Tornado Low Level. This doesn't close until the beginning of March as well. So if you're a member of our Discord community, uh, head on over to the High Score Challenge uh, channels, and you can uh, post a score on both the Specky High Score and the Amiga High Score. You know, speaking of High Score Challenges, Boat, I know this is a little bit off topic. I don't like to toot my own horn. My friend, is this going to be another Warblade thing? No, this is a little. Good. This is a little story about a man. He rose up from obscurity to be the number one Donkey Kong player on the Coco. That'd be your boy right here, Amigo Aaron. Took the top wow. spot last week on Coco Talk. Congratulations! I blew past Boat like he was standing still, crushed the field, and made a special guest appearance. I bring this up because I believe Boat, and you stop me if I'm wrong, because you're. I know you're almost a regular on Coco Talk. I believe that this weekend is, in fact, there's this their 200th episode coming up this weekend. It is Boat tomorrow, and, and so hopefully everything will run nice and smoothly. And uh, because the, they had a rough go of it last week, hey, technical trouble. It's the it's the it, it, what's what goes on these days. Uh, but we we salute you guys uh, on Coco Talk for your 200th episode. Uh, uh, we love you guys, and I was. Happy to finally not look like an idiot when playing a game, but a very rare occurrence. Yeah, yeah. I, it's killing me, as you can tell if you're listening right now, that my audio quality has taken a major dip because uh, I currently don't have the internet, and I'm, I'm we're taping off my phone right now. So, it sounds uh, pretty good, though, Boat. It's okay. Well, I'm glad. I'm, yeah. I'm glad to hear that. I, I uh, Hopefully, the internet will be back, and I'll be able to, uh, if not join Coco Talk, at least be able to watch along tomorrow. So, But yeah, congratulations, guys. Congratulations. All right, Aaron. Speaking of congratulations, 
it's time to congratulate the fine folks that support the show in any of the n number of ways that they can, starting with our Twitch subscribers. So if you watch the show uh, Friday nights uh, on uh, Twitch, uh, we record every Friday around 5 o'clock Eastern. You're welcome to join the crowd. And if you'd like to support us through Twitch, uh, you can. You can subscribe if you are an Amazon Prime uh, customer. You get one free sub a month, so you can support the channel financially, and it costs you nothing. Uh, so we uh, we welcome all of the people that have uh, chosen to do that, including BarkBit, Mitsuyama, Captain Chaos DK, Great Al G, Retro Rewind.ca, Retro Jerry, Pints and Amiga, Rob O'Hara, Eeyore4077, Buck Owens, Macintosh Librarian, Wide World of Retro, Frodo and L, Christian Russell, John Marshall 3, Bruce Sayer, Hermsky, Still Adolescing, Blue Train, Jigglebox, Paco Takate, Negsol, Knight Rider 82, Da Crabs, MTG, Gary Heather, and Chronosnet. Thank you guys so Ooh. much for uh, subscribing to us on Twitch. Thank you. Now, Aaron, uh, before we do the Patreon song this week, uh, I have a, I, I, this is going to shock and stay on you, but I've messed up. I've messed up. Uh, the one, the only David Z, our buddy Dave from yeah. Arizona, the guy that sent us all of our fabulous 3D printed things. Yeah. He became. He became a Patreon supporter uh, uh, about a month ago now, maybe even longer. Did I put him on the Patreon song list? Heck no. Oh. Why? I don't know. Oh, man. I even sent him a message thanking him for doing so. So, he my could, bad, Dave. He could 3D print like a shiv or something and come up here and mess you up, man. That's right. That's right. So, uh, I apologize, Dave. You're going to be at Dave. the front of the line, though, for this, this, this week's song. And, of course... Uh, we want to thank our sponsor, RetroRewind.ca. Thank you, and please patronize their fine store. Yeah. All right. So, Aaron, last week the Patreon song was "List a Mania." Okay. Mm -hmm. Does that mean anything to you? Mm -mm. Have Have you heard of the band Phoenix before? Mm -mm. No. They're French. I know how you love the French. I do love the French, man, but I never I'm not high on their rock bands, I'm not gonna lie. Mm. Nope. So how yeah, did we, you come we didn't across get many, that, we didn't get many responses. Uh all when when all was said and done. Phoenix, perhaps not the international superstars uh that, that some of the other groups are, but we did get three. Z nine, K nine, man, Jigglebox, and Mr. Cola. Those those three guys at Xena, he's winning everything. He's even yeah. winning at that. Z9 well done, wins Z9. at life. Yeah, well. That's what he does. I need to get some pointers from him. Yeah, yeah. All right. If you know this week's Patreon song, send me an email at john at amigospodcast.com. The Patreon band is hard at work at our next masterpiece. So we're doing this one old school, Aaron. Get ready. <clears throat> I've got to kind of shift to the side so I can read the names behind my phone, too. I'll just so try to memorize David Z, George Rosansky, The Amiga Show, Daniel Crabtree, Super Family, King Crazy, Loomis, William, Venter, Scar, Heavy Systems, Inc., Bundy, Fraglord, Mark by Lund, Olive Hope, Hermsky, Jonah, a.k.a. Simulant, Alien Breeder, Dave Velociraptor, Cowboy Boy, Lane Vincent, Blue Cuts, and John Cook. Bomb the base proto in L. Solar incisor tech major again, Mr. Cola. Daniel Williams, Bernard Lucas, Jerry Denton, Zork, the reflection, Simon Lich, Captain Crispy, Kilobytes, and Caffeine. Gary Heather, Free Lunch, K Fox, David Pickford, Cameron Armstrong, Andy Jones, Lobster, Man, Aether, Tenement, and Amiga Retro Guys. Bernard Quinn, RMC, Tim Drew, Simon Rose, Joseph Harrison, Kyle, Ed, Robo, Hera, Matthew, Lara, Moran, D. Craig, Sean, Zobart, B. Roland Burke, Andrew Monks, Joe the Zombie, Lip Lon, Alan Kebab, Chekotay, Level Lord, John Marshall. 
Matthew Caron, Ricky DeRosa, Creepy Dead Boy, Vicky CDZ, The Smallest Norris, Devon Swigard, Morton, Ethan, Helen, Blender 75, Christopher Hassel, Ravi Abbott, Chris Foles, Lauren Giroux, Graham Bebke, and Betty Spear. O'Brien's Retro and Vintage, Gary Hucker, Paul Harrington, Duncan Styles, Taves from the Crib, Josh Nan, Adam Bradley, Jonas, Rulo, THT, Eric Nelson, Kim, Tommy Hulm, Birchstein, Daniel Bingston, Brutal, Barracuda, Darren Coles, Jason Wands, Pixels of Dawn, and Kjobjorn Bar. Hideous. And it Thank was accentuated you. by your horrible microphone. Double trouble. <laughs> why can't... I like to think that it added a little spice. Yeah, why can't the internet freeze up during that? That never happens. It's never happened <laughs> once. I've been begging. It's a, it's a little present from Suddenlink to you, Aaron. That's a little present. All right, get that out of here. <laughs> all right, so... Uh, before we go, we do, of course, want to recognize all the fine folks, many of whom stay up very, very late uh, in their home countries to watch us live. Uh, we want to thank all the cool. fine people out in the chat. We've got our fine, fine moderators, Duncan Styles and Pixels at Dawn Gaming. Duncan Styles, also the producer of This Week in Retro. We want to give him a shout out. He does great work over there with me and Neil, too. Poor long We've also got... Man. 48k we've also got 48k ram here with us amiga gamer 1200 amiga live uh atten barkbit bike me bitstorm brock 101 challenged moose cobrian commander root data dog uk delamort 78 edvin helland eor 4077 eric and 316 frodo and l jigglebox hermsky Level Lord, Jabasoft, Jason Warns, John Marshall Three, fellow West Virginian, joining us. L. Curtis B. Macintosh Librarian, Mitsuyama, Mo Moistique, uh, Mr. Cola, Olaf Hope, Picard 2010, R. Typer, Retro Rewind. C. A. Rob O'Hara, Sp. 43, Super Tech Boy, Tom Toms, Three Foot Strips, V and K, Vector Funk, Violets TV, Wishbone, and Z9 K9. Very good. Thanks for showing up. Thank you guys so much for being here. And of and course, Aaron, before we go, we do want to put all of our thoughts, prayers, concerns, good vibes to all the fine folks all over, at least here in, in America, that have had some wild weather this week. I know that there are some people. Uh, I know 8-Bit Guy has had some troubles. Uh, he, his whole home got flooded because a water pipe oh, broke. I know, I know uh, Macintosh Librarian's down there in Texas, yeah. too. I hope she's doing okay. The Pints so. and Amiga guys are down there. Yeah, Pints and Amiga guys. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like, you know, between the two of us, uh, we got off pretty easy compared to, uh, to, compared to a lot of folks out there. Yeah, we... West Virginia had a zillion down trees uh, from the multiple ice storms and just a lot of people without power. So thumbs up to all you guys that are out there putting this stuff back together, all the suckers out there that are just hanging in there, man. Uh, it's tough. And having no power is a real bummer, but we both know that. We only lost power for a couple of days. Some people haven't had power. My buddy from work hasn't had power for over a week. Uh, yeah. and, no, and now he's got no water. And that's just right down the road from here. So... Uh, you know, hang in there. Warm weather's coming, and hopefully we can all get through this, and we'll be better prepared next time, that's for sure, Boat. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, speaking of being prepared, you all better prepare yourself for next week's game. <laughs> what was that? Do you mind if we dance with your dates? <laughs> so. I was thinking comfort a stranger's accent, but I'll take that oh, okay. one, too. <laughs> I'm not sure who I was challenging there. Um, so, uh, next week's game is going to be Shamalama Ding. Okay. Next week's game is going to be the first in our second look series of games, Aaron. This is the new category that has been uh, created this year for us to take a look back at the first 50 episodes of Amigos, way, way back. The ones we have in A. Aaron. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at Super Skid Marks. Super okay. skid marks, Aaron. Great. Okay. This was a uh, this was suggested to the committee by Chris Folds. And this, I believe, uh was episode thirty-four. Pixels of Dawn informed me. Episode thirty-four of Amigos from way back in twenty sixteen. That'll be that'll be fun. I'm looking forward to getting back because we these were episodes we did with no video and we recorded some of these on like a uh 
a tape deck or a Walkman, or we just mm-hmm. wrote some of them down. You know, there were some re- really old, obscure. So these will be a lot of fun to go back and revisit, Boat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and of course, we want to thank a level lord, uh, members of the Amigos Game Selection Committee, for uh, choosing uh, this game to be suggested, and the committee themselves for voting for this game. Even though this wasn't a perfect game, I think it was fun to talk about it. It was definitely one that needed to be looked at for all of its you know, warts and all. You had to take a look at it. I, I, was, I was glad we looked at it, uh, despite our lack of enthusiasm for it. Yeah, yeah. All right, guys, we will see you next week for Super Skin Marks. Until then, adios. adios.